At the time, I was 10 years old and lived in a small coastal town in Newfoundland that was littered with large forests. Almost every house had acres and acres of forestry behind it, which in itself was very beautiful. As now I am 21 and live in a bustling city in Alberta, I do find myself missing the setting in my old backyard every once in a while, but it's usually accompanied by the unsettling memory of what I'm about to recount. By the time I was in grade four, I was already trusted to be home by myself as my mother went out to visit my grandmother and aunt who literally lived a few minutes down the road from us. I was happy to have such a privilege. I was an only child and my father worked in another province months at a time, so I was very lucky to have this opportunity. It usually meant late night movies and video games and on the odd night, exploring the forests. This night, I was exploring said woods. I usually never went too far in. Usually up to a large rock formation, I like to climb and look out through the trees in all directions. The house was always in sight, so I never felt scared or frightened by being there. It felt like my own private place that I could enjoy. So as I was scaling the rock to sit in my usual spot, I suddenly started hearing a sound from further in. A sound that wasn't natural at all. Crying. Faint crying. It sounded like a child, maybe even an infant, crying relentlessly. I was more puzzled than scared, since crying was the last thing I would expect to hear in the forest. I must have listened for a few good minutes, convinced my ears were playing tricks on me, but it was in fact crying. In my mind, I imagined it was a young girl that somehow wandered too far into the forest and needed help. I considered going back to the house and calling my mother for help, but then I worried that the girl would wander further beyond earshot. I decided to try to locate the sound myself. I made my way hastily through the trees and branches, trying to figure out the exact direction the crying was in. It definitely wasn't as easy as I thought, and it was a matter of trial and error to even make sure I was going in the right direction. One thing I never realized as I was doing all this was how consistent the crying was. No pauses, no words of any kind, just non-stop sobbing and wailing that had no end. What I did notice was the closer I got to the sound, the more metallic it sounded to me. I eventually reached a small clearing that had only a few small trees and bushes and nothing else. I had never gone this far in before, so this was the first time I ever seen it. When I made my way in, it didn't take long for me to find the source of the sound. A gray tape recorder, one of the biggest I've ever seen, was peeking out from one of the bushes and the crying was coming out of the speakers. This really disturbed me as I had went all this way expecting to find a real person, but it was only a tape recorder. As I was about to shut it off, I heard another sound coming from the outside of the clearing on the opposite side. It sounded like steady steps advancing in my direction. It only took seeing a tall shadowy figure coming my way to send me running. Fortunately, by some miracle, I recognized my way back identifying the rocks and trees I had passed earlier. Looking back, this probably saved my life. I never looked back and I didn't try listening to see if the person was following me. I just kept telling myself to make it home and nothing else. I had to get home. Once I saw the large rock formation. It didn't take me long to know the rest of the way without needing to survey my surroundings. I was out of the forest in record time and immediately ran into my house, locking the doors and shutting all the lights off as I went into my bedroom. I didn't want this person to know where I lived or I would really be done for. After shutting the curtains of my window, I peeked out through them as discreetly as I could to see if whoever had been out there had actually managed to keep up with me. I didn't see anyone. But I stayed by that window for a good hour, waiting for someone to emerge out of the forest shadows, but nothing ever did. After that, I went straight to bed. I never did tell my mother about what happened that night, and I also never was able to go back into that forest again. It was the summer before my senior year in college. My little brother, always interested in military stuff, had gotten a pair of night vision goggles for his birthday, and he had left them in my apartment. One night, I was bored 
and decided to try out the goggles at a wooded hiking area or nature preserve nearby. In retrospect, this seems like a very stupid idea since I was all by myself, but I was young and stupid, and I got myself all excited at the possibility of seeing deer and other woodland creatures in their natural nighttime habitat. I was familiar with these woods. My best friend and I had hiked there at night before, and we had never run into anyone else. Our area is mostly rural and pretty safe, so I didn't anticipate any trouble. I parked in the little sparsely lit parking area, ignored the sign saying park closes at 10, and entered the woods, night vision goggles in hand. It was a half moon that night, and that was the only light that filtered down through the canopy of trees. It was pretty dark, and I didn't want to put on the goggles until I'd found a place to sit down. So I lit my way with the mini mag light on my keychain. A couple of times, I thought I heard a little rustling in the woods, a fair distance away. But it was nothing out of the ordinary, and I figured it to be animal activity. Hopefully the deer I'd come hoping to see. After I hiked in a fair distance, I found a fallen log to sit on and put on the goggles. I don't know if you've ever used night vision goggles before, but the effect is impressive. They can turn near pitch darkness into brightest day. Everything appears in shades of green, but quite bright and clear. For a while, I had a blast looking around from my fallen log vantage point. Some chipmunks played around in the leaves nearby, and a big owl blinked its lamp-like eyes at me from a tree branch. No deer though, and I started to think that maybe they wouldn't be likely to come anywhere near me if I sat right out in the open on a log, regardless of it being so dark. So I decided to find a place where I could be a little more hidden. I made my way a little deeper into the woods and finally found a huge tree, perfect for climbing. I've always loved climbing trees, so it was nothing for me to hoist myself up a few branches and settle in to wait for my deer. I didn't get to see any. What I did see, lit up in bright night vision green after about 10 minutes of waiting, was this. A man, dressed head to toe in dark colored clothing, making his way stealthily through the woods. He was coming from the same direction I had come, and was clearly trying to stay hidden, moving from tree to tree and glancing around carefully before moving on again. It looked very much like he was looking for someone. It took me a few moments to notice that he was carrying something. And when I saw what it was, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. He had a knife, a big one, and he was gripping it as if he expected to use it. It wasn't deer hunting season, and this was a nature preserve where hunting of any kind was prohibited. And at any rate, the guy was alone and not dressed like a hunter. There were no deer in sight, and I don't know any hunters that kill their prey with knives. I was suddenly horribly aware of my situation. A young woman alone, weaponless, in the middle of the woods, at night. This was the 90s, so no cell phones, and even if I'd had one, I wouldn't have felt safe using it lest I draw his attention. I didn't know how he was able to see so well in the dark. I guess his eyes had just adjusted, and I was terrified he would look up and see me. I sat there, afraid to move, afraid to breathe and watched him as he continued his methodical and stealthy process of scanning the forest for who or whatever he was stalking. I scanned around but couldn't see anyone else, even from my high vantage point, and the sickening thought struck me that he might be looking for me. I remember the rustling noises I'd heard in the woods when I first arrived, and then I thought back further and remembered something else. A white car that had followed 
too close behind me for most of my drive to the nature preserve. I had been annoyed and a little freaked out at a time, but when I turned into the nature preserve parking area, the white car had passed me and driven on its way, and I hadn't thought anything more of it. Now I wondered, horrified, if this was the driver of that car, if he had circled back and seen my parked car alone in the lot, if he had come in after me. I sat paralyzed with fear and watched the man for what felt like forever but it was probably another half hour or so. There was a heart-stopping moment when he paused right underneath my tree, and I was sure he was going to look up and find me. But he didn't. After a while, he seemed to give up on whatever plan he had in mind. I heard him say, forget it, and he started heading back in the direction he had come, the direction of the parking area. I stayed in the tree, wet with sweat, and crying until the sun came up a few hours later. Then I climbed down and still terrified, gripping the little can of pepper spray on my keychain and made my way as fast as I could to the parking lot. The man had been there. My windshield had been smashed with a rock, and someone had scraped all down the sides of the car with something sharp. Presumably, a giant knife that, I'm lucky, didn't end up in my chest. Thank God for the night vision goggles that let me see him before he could see me. And thank God for big trees with sturdy branches. I grew up in the countryside, right next to a national park, frequently visited by nature lovers and bird enthusiasts. It was the kind of park where you're not really allowed to bike or ride horses, only walk and run. But 10 year old me felt it was a stupid rule and did so anyway because the trails were perfect for riding. I knew fully well that I wasn't supposed to do that and was caught a few times but nothing much came from it apart from the half hearted don't do it again and I did of course. Until one day something frightening happened that made me stop. My family were horse breeders and I would often take one of the horses for a ride, usually in the forbidden park. This day, very early in the morning, the first day of the summer holiday, it was beautiful outdoors, misty and foggy, yet a sky that promised a sunny day ahead. Since it was so early, before 6 o'clock, I knew there wouldn't be anyone on the trail to see me, so I let the horse set off, full speed along the trail. I only slowed down on the part of the trail that got a little steep on one side, leading down to the river because the thought of one step too close to the edge was too much even for a kid with next to non-existing risk assessment skills. Suddenly the horse came to a halt and refused to take another step. I grew up with horses all my life and knew that usually indicates that you need to investigate. Is there something with the hoofs? Did the horse spot something that spooked it? The hoofs were fine, but the horse didn't move an inch. That's when I saw it. Someone had set up a trap a thin sharp metal wire across the trail and perfect neck height for an adult. I stopped and looked around but didn't see anyone. The wire was well attached to two trees and impossible for me to remove. So I started to lead the horse around it and to do so I had to walk a bit up into the wooded area on the side of the trail. That is when I heard the singing. The melody was familiar but I couldn't make out the words. It was being sung in a muffled sniggering voice. Today, I still get chills thinking about that eerie voice coming from somewhere deep in the forest. As I knew, I was being watched there in the fog. I, as silently as I could, with my heart in my throat, backed away, got up in my horse, and hurried back the way I came as fast as I could. I knew I had to tell someone about it, but at the same time, I wanted to avoid admitting to riding a huge and very forbidden horse on those protected trails, so now I had a problem. I got home and told my older brother what had happened, and he went back there with me in tow. We found the wire trap, and after a while of searching, we also found a spear-like pole in the ground, right on the spot where you'd land if you came running and jumping over a fallen tree on the trail. That's when we called the police. 
The area was searched, and several similar traps found, but no sight of who had set them. The following summer, there was big news in the local paper about spear-like poles being found again, but this time, right under the surface of our local lake, directly under a well-known dive spot. And black garbage bags, filled with big rocks, were found on the narrow bridge across the river, so if a car had hit them, chances are it would have gone off the road and into the water. To my knowledge, whomever had set these traps were never found. I am forever grateful I was riding my horse that day, who was able to sense this danger and more than likely save my life. A couple years ago, I was stressed out from college and big city life and decided to spend a long weekend in the woods doing what my city friends consider utter lunacy and us outdoorsy people consider nirvana. Deep woods, free camping, in the winter, alone. While this sounds like the beginning of a missing persons report, if you're an experienced outdoors man, it's pretty safe. I also take a secret pleasure in being the white trash warrioress my dad always hoped I'd be. I also hated the feeling of claustrophobia that came with being female in the city. Avoiding eye contact, not walking alone at night. When you're a girl, alone out in the woods, you're in charge. You're safe within the warm embrace of your own solitary freedom. Or so I thought. I spent a few hours on the roads, the surroundings getting wilder and wilder as I drove. I parked in an allowed roadside ditch and with a compass and a map, hiked until I was in a mile's reach or so of some good ice fishing. I was at least four miles from the road. I made an extremely discreet camp in a clearing with just one little hole in the snow for my tiny tent and my tiny campfire. After a couple beautiful days of just hiking and relaxing around camp, I made the trek to the fishing hole. Everything was an utter winter stillness. The air was crisp, and the only signs that I wasn't in a perfect vacuum were the twitterings of birds and the very distant rumblings of the half-frozen waterfalls. After a mile or so of crunching along in the snow, I silently celebrated my compass skills when I came out at the exact place I had intended to. I punched a hole in the thin crust of ice and started to fish. My first catch came quickly. After a few weeks under frozen surface, the fish were hungry. I was feeling oddly fatigued and jumpy, so I decided to just clean the fish here and now and take it straight back to camp to cook. I quickly realized my fish preparation skills were rusty at best. I cursed my lack of preparation as I cut myself for the second time. Something in my peripheral sight was irritating me, but I was very set in my task, focusing on the slippery mess and trying not to cut myself again. The thing in my peripheral senses was growing more irritating, like the buzzing of a fly or the yammering of a sibling. I carved and hacked and sliced my hand open freshly as the fish slipped out of my hands and into the snow. Frustrated, I shouted, Piss off with that whistling, will you? Silence resumed. And then, my heart stopped. Until that very moment, I hadn't realized how in my own head I was, and how out of tune I was with what was happening in my surroundings. Living in a college neighborhood, I had grown so accustomed to white noise that I'd failed to recognize how grossly inappropriate the sound was in this context. The silence weighed down on me as I broke into a sweat. The only reason a human would be this deep in the woods would be to hunt. And no hunter would give himself away like that. And if he was whistling for any other reason, shouldn't he have reacted to my outburst? Yelled something vulgar back? Apologized? No, nothing. Just the total stillness of the woods. 
silence as pure as it was before I spoke. Unsure if I had misheard the twitterings of a bird or something, I just decided the fish was a lost cause. I slung my gear over my shoulder and headed for camp. I trudged off into the woods, and about a quarter mile from my camp, I saw a large mass protruding from the snow. Apprehensive but drawn, like a moth to the flame, I trudged up to what materialized in the closing distance as a moose kill. A really, really good moose kill. A clean shot through the upturned eye, staring at me. As I stared into where would have been the eye, I was overwhelmed with an intense feeling of dread, an instinctual gut feeling to get out. Get out now. I ran. I ran hard and I ran fast. In the snow and the woods, everything looked the same. I knew I was moving south, and I knew I had passed camp to the east. I made for the road, eventually slowing down to a weary trudge calming at the comforting side of the woods clearing ahead to make way for the country roadway. I looked to my left and saw my car 50 yards or so down, jogged to it, and drove the lonely 15 miles to the first motel I saw signs for. I had none of my belongings and no earthly idea why I had just abandoned ship like that. It was only as I was sitting up watching infomercials that night that it started to fall together. Why would the park service issue free camp passes for the same stretch of woods that they allowed hunting? The moose defied everything of my rudimentary understanding of hunting. Even with the snow to cool it, decom starts quickly on an animal that size. You'd have time for a few quick pictures, but you'd want to have it dressed quickly. Why would you kill a moose five miles into the forest? How could you ever drag it back to the road? In the morning, in a sleep-deprived and paranoid state, I described everything I'd seen and thought I heard to a very confused park ranger. He seemed more vexed about the illegal hunting than any of my crazy city girl ramblings. He said he wanted to come pick me up and have me taken to where I thought the kill site was. I said I was only going if he brought a gun. He sighed with exasperation and told me when to meet him. We rode out into the woods on an ATV with me awkwardly riding on the back. We got to the large impression in the snow where the moose had been. Blood was everywhere. There was also a distinct track of the carcass being dragged. The drag marks have a smooth trail in the snow, as if the carcass were on a tarp. The ranger said he would take me back now. He asked me where my camp was. I pointed in the direction of the drag marks. It looked like he was finally sharing in my unease, and he said he would take me back to town and then come back to further investigate and would break down my camp for me and deliver my stuff to the hotel. Back at the hotel, I washed my clothes in the sink and prepared to drive home in the morning. An unknown number called my phone. It was the park ranger. The moose had been tracked to my campsite. He described the scene as a huge mess. He wasn't sure if an animal had helped to make the mess, but one thing was clear. Someone had cut into my tent with a knife. I asked about the rest of my belongings. He said darkly, you don't want them back. They're covered in moose mess. Someone had dumped the bloods and guts of the carcass inside my tent and smeared it all over my gear. So, uh, what happens now? I asked. Well, miss, we're just gonna keep an eye out for this guy. I haven't heard of or seen anything like this ever before. I'm really sorry this happened, he responded. And that was it. No closure, no explanation. In the years that have passed, I've tried every different application of reason. 
a hunter who needed help but knew I was already gone, a deranged psychopath looking to make a second kill. I still don't know why I didn't hear the gunshot. The whistling seems so vivid in my memory, but was it even real? One question has been definitely answered. I'll never go into the woods alone again.